tonight, I am thrilled to have the artist Liliana Porter here. As many of you are aware, I am a huge fan of Liliana's work after first encountering it, and specifically Man with Axe and other, brief, and other Brief Situations at the 2017 Venice Biennale. Um, I pitched um, an invitation to Liliana for the fall. She accepted, something came up, and we had to cancel, so I'm thrilled that we've been able to um, write that so quick in this season. Um, Liliana was born in Argentina and is now based in New York. Um, she has had a long and productive career, beginning with her studies um, at a school of fine arts in um, Buenos Aires at the age of 12, um, before moving to Mexico City at 17 to study art at the Ibero American University, where she became very involved with the art community there and I think made some connections that served her as she moved forward. Then, passing through New York on her way to Paris in 1965, she became enamored with that city, that being New York, and its opportunities, so she postponed her trip to Europe making New York her new home where she lives to this day. That same year, she joined forces with Louis um, uh, Comente, Comente? Uh, Comente, Comente, I should know this, Louis Comente, you know who I'm talking about, the New York Graphic Workshop and um, all of the great conceptual artists. Also with um, Jose Guillermo uh, Castillo, um, to co-found, in fact, the New York um, Graphic Workshop. Um, success was swift um, for Liliana. Um, her multimedia, multidisciplinary work um, has been celebrated with, inter with an international array of exhibitions. By 1973, she had a solo show um, in the Projects Room um, at MoMA in New York. And if I, my calculation's right, she was all of about 25 years old. <laughs> Uh, in 1980, she received a Guggenheim Fellowship, and in 1991, uh, the, Bronx, the Bronx Museum of Art organized a retrospective of her work. Uh, Liliana is represented um, by her work in major collections, including uh, the Blanton Museum of Art in Austin, the Metropolitan Museum of Art New York, the Museo Tomeo in um, Mexico City, Museum of Fine Arts Houston, Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, Tate Modern in London, the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. So um, as you can see, she's, um, she's well represented um, with major um, institutions throughout the world. She uh, affiliated with the pioneering wave of Latinx artists. Liliana's work was featured um, in the traveling exhibition Radical Women, Latin American Art, 1960 and 1985 at the Brooklyn Museum, New York, and then um, traveling, I, I think, to the Hammer um, in Los Angeles. Most recently, there was a much lauded performance created by Liliana and Anna uh, Tisconia uh, titled Them at the Kitchen in New York um, this past October. Um, and then Liliana Porter, Other Situations, a nonlinear uh, survey organized by SCAD Museum of Art is currently showing at El Museo del Barrio uh, in New York through March 3rd. As I understand, that has been extended to March 3rd, so if there's any chance of you being in New York, I highly recommend that you check that out. Um, Liliana has continuously, and with uh, I think a recent surge, received a great deal of attention for charming yet subversive work that pulls you into um, its often intimate scale only to knock you off balance um, with carefully placed jabs um, that land political, relational, historical, and so forth punches um, that, and leave you wanting more. And tonight, we have the extraordinary good fortune of having the, art, the artist here herself to give us insight into this intriguing, enticing work. So if you would, please join me in welcoming Liliana Porter. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Very grateful that I have been invited to be with you. And I brought some images to show you. 
What you can see here that looks like this menacing man with an ax is only four inches high. <laughs> and it's an, an, a figurine I found in a flea market. And some years ago, and I had this idea to uh, make an installation called The Man with an Ax. And the idea was that he will start, you know, breaking everything in front of him from small things to all kinds of objects until the biggest object was a piano upside down. And then, you know, I think you think after you do it what it means. And I really think that he, he must be like a metaphor of time, you know, that all these things in front of him are you know, are like what time leave behind and that things that remain as memories, no? And let's see. So this is a general view of, of the installation that was at the Venice Biennale. And the men, if you see, you know, the, on the left, he is there. So he's breaking everything. What you see in the back is the piano upside down. So at least you can see the scale. So all the things that were happening there had to do with a lot of, of it, it's almost a retrospective of my own work because you find there a lot of figurines and subjects I have been used before. Um, and one thing that I am very interested in the subject of representation and also in the subject of time. And I like very much how I think that when we remember things or in our memory, things are not in order. They are, you can have uh, simultaneously things from different times, from different uh, physicality, from different narratives that happen at the same time. And I like that possibility of challenging the idea of that time is a linear thing. So uh, during, when you see this installation, you start seeing in the debris, or if you really look at it, there are very minimal situations, like little narratives, maybe somebody's cleaning up, or somebody, there is a dialogue, or there is a, a traveler, are all subjects that I have been repeating in my work in printmaking, drawing, video, photography, and lately in theater. So for in, these are still images of that, uh, the men with the axe. So for instance, there is the gardener, the guy who is you know, watering the plants, even if the plants are drawings in a broken plate. And so they, those are all subjects that I, I repeated in many different works, um, or the men who clean, the, somebody who cleans up, no? or a series I did that I call forced labor. And in general, are these tiny figures trying to do these enormous tasks that are superior to their ability? No, they are trying to this. How do you say this? Untangle the opposite of untangle, <laughs> uh, these cords that are this enormous black mass of uh, cords. And, uh, and I think that is like a metaphor of ourself in front of reality or in front of this, the possibility of an explanation of what we are doing here. No? And also there, there are some, even if there is distractions and things, there are always some hopeful situations, like somebody who you know cleans up, even though it's an enormous task, but they look sort of at ease doing this. Or the weaver, the weaver that is weaving this enormous thing and seems she has the time to do it. <laughs> uh, in the back, there is a dialogue. I love those dialogues of impossible combinations, but at the same time, you know, I have all these figurines and sometimes I put them together and it takes a while until some of them click. And sometimes, you know, it's impossible to see the dog and the bird in general, they don't talk too much to each other. <laughs> uh, then also there are 
things that have to do with collective memory that I found this small car uh, that is a collection of German cars, of presidential cars, but this one is the only one with, with people inside. And it, it, it's amazing that, you know, that when you see that, you know that it, this is a minute before of the, you know, assassination. And, and all these objects that exist after, you know, after people, after situation, after heroes, you know, that become all these strange uh, objects. Well, of course, the clocks are perfect, a little obvious for the subject of time. And this one, now, this is a photograph. And it's interesting to me to think, you know, the other one are objects that you can touch, and this is on paper. It's, uh, the objects are in, inside the virtual space, and it's only one possibility. You cannot go around and see them, but I give you only one view, no? which is a photograph. And, but the, what is happening here is the same, no? that they are um, totally from different, uh, yeah, there is Elvis Presley, uh, Kennedy's son, a dancer from Spain, the communist uh, with the gun, he's a dance actually, Mickey Mouse, the Nazi, you know, had nothing to do with each other, but they are all occupying the same space and at the same, being there almost like a family portrait. No? And, and then this is a shelf with real objects. And, it's interesting because, of course, now everything becomes an image. But, you know, uh, here, this is a thing with, that you could touch. And I like that here you can see that some of the ones that were in the photograph before. And I, I like that transition between the real and the virtual and the memory. And uh, uh, it really intrigues me also how things become objects and how we relate to those objects and re-signify uh, them. This is a work um, from 1973. Now we are going back to from time. But even if visually it looks totally different, it's exactly the same subject. Is the photo of a silver gelatin print of my hand where I had I drew this line and then made the photograph and then the photograph is placed on the wall so and I continue the line. So what I like is the idea of making a consistent line that is uh, that let's say if we put the photograph now on a wall and continue the line, you, we have decades going from one light to the other, but we still perceive them as a consistent line. No? Um, so that interests me because I think that's the way the mind really works. No? This one is uh, called 40 years because from the photograph inside to the, my hand on the right, there were 40 years. Now we will have a different title because time continues. I cannot stop time. But, but I love that in this photograph, the mat is a photograph. No? So there is a photograph, the photograph of the mat, the photograph of my hand, and then the line that the work is finished when you continue the line on the wall. So now this line goes through different times, different virtual spaces, and and also, like you really realize the ungraspable quality, you know, of time. No? Uh, this is the same concept, the triangle. You know, I like this the consistent triangle, and it really is totally dislocated. No? This <laughs> I, is called Reconstruction, Bird with Yellow Beak. This is from 2008. I did, at this point, like 35 different reconstructions because I really like this idea of having first the photograph of the broken thing and then the object 
in our space that is perfect, no? So either I, I reverse time or I am a fantastic restorer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there is something moving to me about that possibility, no, of reversing time. <laughs> this one is from 1996, it's called The Light, and it's a work on canvas next to the frame uh, silver gelatin print. And, well, I hear, I mean, it's always the same subject that's finally boring, no? but I like that, for instance, that the lamp, which is a Christ, is a plastic Christ that is a lamp, is inside the virtual <coughs> space of a canvas, of a painting. And then, but you really see how they relate, even though the other one the Mickey Mouse is in the other space, but the shadow seems to continue from the photograph to the canvas. And besides, you know, that putting together those dislocated spaces, there are more dislocations here because Christ was supposed to have existed at one point and Mickey Mouse is an invention. But now they are both in, in the same virtual space of the, of the past. And besides that, it's amazing that it's a lamp. O sea, that there is an impersonation of a lamp. How things become other things, and we sort of, you know, we, we are not that surprised, I think, by now. <laughs> Here we can see it a little closer. This is a print um, tiger from 2002. It's a woodcut. And again, I like this idea that the scratch is in the paper, so it's in, in our space. No? So he's, you know, inside both spaces. And now going even farther back, the postcard, 1975. This is a, a photo etching. It's a series of 15 different prints I made using a book of uh, reproductions of works of Magritte. And I, I have the book open in this page where there is a painting of Magritte of the man with the apple on top of his head. And I put a real apple on top of the book. I took a photograph and I did the photo etching. And I really, you know, like uh, to put together this, the real and the, and the virtual when not. But then the print becomes also a virtual space because then the apple is not real anymore. So um, everything becomes virtual. Also the, the book, you know, it's on, only a representation. But I think that's what, like represent, I think everything is a representation and I think that is, to arrive to the archetype is, is very difficult, I would say. Then the traveler from 2000. This, this image was a photograph, was a real thing on, the, on a shelf, um, you know, became uh, different things. But I like very much the idea that the traveler, in order to get home, had to have the faith that he's able to go inside the, <laughs> the base. No? And I think that, you know, that, is a sort of a romantic thought. And then this dialogue is the same, you know. I think they really relate very well. No, he's not worried if the duck is a drawing or... <laughs> <laughs> it is a kind of giving in of the strange the quality of, of reality, you know. Um, okay, this, because every image that I, I, I am showing you, in, I have many different versions of, of these subjects. And this is this one I really like because it's called uh, the correction. And it's a correction of a scribble, <laughs> it, which is a super presumptuous thing, right? <laughs> Because the scribble is always correct. 
And so I, I really, I'm sure it has a moral that goes beyond my own understanding, but if we understood it, it would be good for us. And then this is a photograph of that idea of the forced labor, but in a sh this is, you know, the final thing is a, is a photograph. Um, because it's interesting that some are photographs, some are real, some, you know, uh, how they, they also change according to the technique. Like this is a, the, it's a, the weaver, but in this case in a shelf instead of in the installation. Um, ah, this is a series that I, I had people who are fixing objects. <laughs> and I mean, he, to fix this clock must be really almost impossible, but he really doesn't care and is in, in the process of trying to fix it. And are all these objects that for me are sort of moving because when you look close at, at the figurine, he doesn't look desperate or anything. He looks like he will eventually do it. No? And here is another version in a shelf of the, the gardener. Um, now, this is a, a close-up of a work on paper. This is a work on paper. So the guy, I, you know, you see it in the bottom. It's the same guy, this one. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting, the, the moment when I do it, because I become him. So, so I, I'm putting the, I, I am him, and suddenly, you know, he takes my place. <laughs> this one I put here because I thought I didn't put any painting. But the problem with the works on canvas is that the objects are very small and the painting is big, so it's difficult to photograph. But anyway, it's a painting that has uh, three, six panels. And the first one on the left is like a, like a tsunami of very thick paint and a lot of characters and objects and things sort of attached to it, like falling. And then the, the um, sailboat is also real. I mean, I attach it to the canvas. And then the, the three frames are photographs of fragments of the boat or things that are happening inside the painting. So it's like a document of the same thing that is there. No? And then there is, um, there is the traveler on the, almost the, the one before the last one, is all the drawing of the, the way. And the traveler is super tiny, but it's there if you really look close. So this one was called uh, um, Untitled at Sea. Wow doesn't help the title. <laughs> um, this I put here because it's a still of a video. I did five videos. And it's very interesting. I, st I never really have to confess, like very much video art. But one day I was photographing a, a figurine, was a Pinocchio with cymbals. And I had the, I wind, wind up the toy and was making the noise like this. And when it stopped, that silence was really moving for me. And I thought, well, the only way I can show the silence if, if you show the noise before. And to do it, I needed a video, no? a film. So that's the way I started to do videos. And the videos in general are like vignettes of situations, are not animations in the sense that I don't make any trick. If the object moves by itself, it's true, but I don't you know, do strange things or anything. In general, they are sort of um, very still, but the music is it's very important. I discovered the music when I did the first video. 
and a friend of mine said it needs some, you know, sound or something. And he introduced me to Sylvia, Sylvia Meyer, who is the person that the musician I work in all the videos from that day, and also the, I did five uh, theater plays. And the music really is very mani manipulative. I mean, you can put an object, and according to the music, you see it as menacing or romantic or uh, moving or boring, no? So this particular image is from a video called um, Fox in the Mirror, and it was like a, conceived as a concert, a concert in the literal sense, you know, people playing music, but also in the sense that things different things happening at the same time. No? And this uh, was funny because that Mickey Mouse, who is the director of the thing, didn't have ears. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I found it like that, no? and I thought, wow, this is perfect no? as, a, <laughs> as a metaphor. Uh, I, I wish I had brought some videos. Well, this was Lulu, also is from one of the videos, um, she sang very well. <laughs> this is an image from a theater play. I really, really was, a, for me, a very happy experience to do that. I did a, a three in Arge, four in Argentina, and the last one in New York in the Kitchen Theater, which is a place I respect very much and was like a treat to be able to do it there. It, but I brought the actors from Buenos Aires because it was already my group, except one that had to talk a, a monologue that had to speak English, so it was an American actor. And this scene, and it's, there are different scenes, things happening, but this one was, a, it was called, a, how was it? A, Sculpture class, advanced level. So she comes, puts the Mickey Mouse on the right, and starts copying the Mickey Mouse, but really terrible, no? But trying, she was like teaching the public how to copy. And then when she finished, you know, she showed it like that, and is <laughs> and very proud. And then she takes the model away and leaves the object. And the next thing, the next thing is a, <laughs> is a guy who is an auctioneer from a very uh, sophisticated art auction house, and is auctioning the piece. And the incredible thing is that he starts using all this vocabulary, you know, that we use in art, describing the piece, and he really, the piece becomes transformed according to that Narrative. No, he starts saying that it you know, was an, an, a piece from an unknown artist, the most uh, expensive or more wanted piece of this unknown artist, and that you know had the influence of the French brutalism, <laughs> and that look how perfect are the mistakes, and you know all those things. And after a while, he. Uh, he auctioned the piece for a lot of money <laughs> to the Walt Disney Corporation <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in San Francisco. And, but you know, as you can see, everything I show you has to do with the subject of, of meaning and representation. You know, how things can change according to uh, the narrative and how uh, the only you know, question reality, because I believe that the only reality that exists is our relationship with the things, that we, we are each of us a context through a lens that recreate or create reality. And it's totally different, uh, the view of each of us, and I think there is a responsibility uh, that we have to create a reality that, since we are the ones doing it, that could be a little post, more positive or less depressing. No? And well, this was the last image I put there because it was the end of one of the 
the place where they were, uh, they brought all the objects they used in the play because the objects were as important as the people. So I think what we should do now is to have a dialogue or something, you know? Maybe you want to ask questions or something, so uh, probably I forgot to say things. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, this is kind of a big question. And it, it may be irrelevant, so just let me know if it is. But you mentioned a couple of times the word boring when you were talking, and you, it didn't seem derogative. It didn't, and I was wondering. Um, I'm interested in that notion, and I'm in, I'm wondering if you find value in boring. Um, well, no. I in general. That's why I never like too much uh, video art, because in general it's boring. No? <laughs> and I really, I think every artist, when you are working, you are doing it, there is somebody there that you are addressing. There is a, no? I don't know, the public is an invention in your head. Some people hate this other person. And I love them. I don't want to be born. I want to be happy. I want to be able to communicate. I, you know, but it's interesting. If you analyze different artists, you can really see the relationship with this other that you want is making a dialogue. So I really uh, prefer that things are not boring. I don't know why I said boring. I, I just, you said it a couple of times, and I thought, I don't think she thinks that's bad. So I was wondering if you did. No, well, it, what happened, words, uh, boring could be, it depends, no? What, when, in what context we are saying mm -hmm. that word. Sure, no? yeah, yeah. Yes. And could you talk a little bit more about the theater pieces and how you came to going into that? Okay. <laughs> no, yeah, it was amazing. But what happened? I made a, a dia there was a book. It's a dialogue with the next Katzenstein. And at the end, she asked me, "What would you like to do in the future?" And I say, "A theater play." You know, like one thing's going to China. Or, you know. <laughs> And she, at that, uh, she's now the creator of Latin America at, at MoMA, but at that time she was in Argentina, a director of an art program in a university in Buenos Aires. So after a while I go to Buenos Aires and I see her and she says, listen, I have the sponsor for your theater play. We have the money. And I said, what theater play, no? <laughs> <laughs> and she, so she said, you, we need to spend the money before one year and th three months. <laughs> I, of course, I suddenly started to have ideas. And the interesting thing, because let's say when you think of a drone, you have the paper is the virtual space. When you think of a theater, you think the stage, and there is all these conventions that are there, almost half of the work, because it's incredible the fact that you have a space, people are sitting there, and without making any you know, arrangements, they are willing to give in to the illusion of what is going to happen there. No? And I thought uh, that would be the first time I would work with people, because all my works, I never, except my hands or something like that, work with humans. And I thought this is going to be very interesting, but I found one thing amazing. That when I find the objects, all these objects that I don't make, I find them. They already come with a narrative, with their life, with everything. But the people, the actors, they, they are empty. They come and say, tell me who I am. I have to tell them who they are, what they have to do, no? Uh, the actors are nobody. So it's, uh, it was very interesting because it was more work than to work with objects. <laughs> and, 
uh, it was very interesting, but also it came very natural, really, the idea of working scenes, situations that were, they were not a, a narrative of like a normal play, but they were situations one after the other, like dislocated, but somehow after a while they made sense. And some were very funny, some were very serious, uh, and was a lot of work. I had to learn a lot, but it, it's fantastic to work in theater because it's a team. So they are, the lights are important, the sound is important, it, all kinds of things that I had a great team and we were able to do it as like a clock, really, and the music was important. So the first experience was in a real theater, like a theater in Buenos Aires that was very beautiful, very old fashioned, decadent, you know, with velvet seats and everything. And, and were six uh, representations, six different days. And I thought, well, the first day, there were 250 seats. I thought, well, it's my country, the first day, they all come. But what happened the other five days? Huh? And it, I, it was a fantastic experience because this, the second day, all the seats were sold from the sixth day, so my ego was. <laughs> but it was, I was very moved because I felt that people, you know, reacted the way the the ideal work I, I wanted them to react, and I learned a lot. Also, the actors were fantastic, and they like you have an idea, but they give you like a lot of more ideas, and so it's like working with somebody else. It's, I feel that I everybody worked, and I got the credit. Hmm? So, yes. Uh, I'm curious to know how um, your work was before you were doing the little figures. When you were in school, how did you how did you come to this? Figures? Well, um, let's say my first uh, works. Um, my first show, I was 17. Now I have three hours to tell you. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was mainly in the beginning a printmaker. And the first prints were like with a lot of influence of Picasso and things like that. Then um, when I came to New York in 64 and I started the New York Graphic Workshop, before that, the work was sort of expressionistic and were mainly prints and very much into the technique. But when we started the New York Graphic Workshop with, uh, I have to say the name, Luis Kamnitzer, and, and the other one was okay, Jose Castillo, we were really, the idea was to really analyze what we were doing. And we realized that we were too much involved in the technique and we were not saying, not in the idea. So we wanted to reverse the thing and go from the idea to the technique. So I, I decided to work with the simplest things I could imagine. So they were like little nails or a shadow or a wrinkled paper. And, and, but right there, this is 65 more or less, already the work had that thing of illusion and reality. You know, the string, the, let's say the, the etching of a string and then a real string or the nail. You know, already I can see, like if you see all my work, like for instance, I was showing the one with the hand. The one of the hand is the, on the 70s, long time ago. So um, they were more minimal, more conceptual at that time also. And then what happened, and let's see how I went from one thing to the other. At one point I started to make this, uh, paintings and drawings, and I started to add objects. The first objects were like sailboats, then came one Mickey Mouse, and suddenly I had all these hundred of characters that I realized they became like a cast. Through them, I could say a lot of things. And from there to the videos and then to people, it's very, you know, logical, I think. 
I don't know if I answer your question. <laughs> yes. So I found a lot of like humor in your work, and I think a lot of people already noticed that. And um, I was interested in how you bring the relationship with the 3D object, with the drawings, 2D, two-dimensional ones, and then um, what is it, knitting person, and then too big, like vest your stuff and I wanted to know your personal art practices and what's particular about well now for instance I don't work first with one technique then with the other I generally go from one to the other and I still do prints a lot and work on paper I do work on canvas I, I always am open to the theater experience and I just finished a new video. So I, I go through all the different techniques um, because for some things, um, each technique gives you new, you know, different possibility of saying things. Um, what was the question? <laughs> so does it become more intuitive or? Ah, I think what happened through all these, there is only one subject. And the subject is that I am, I, I am intrigued by, you know, the, what is the whole thing about? No? So, because in art you are so much into the real and the virtual space, which means into um, what we think is more real because we can touch, and then all the memory. And I feel that reality almost doesn't exist because two seconds ago, you know, when I was, you know, showing this, the images, that's where is that moment, no? And the moment, the, the actual moment is ungraspable because it goes very fast and it's, we, we feel that everything is a horizontal thing, but in reality it's almost like non-existent, no? So, uh, the past, which is everything, in that past are all the images, the memories, the imaginary things and the real things. Suddenly it doesn't matter if they are invented or real. It's like, for instance, when we think about history, if you are not a very good art history, uh, history student, you don't know who was first or after, or maybe you you know, you, you make a mistake of hundreds of years thinking that, I don't know, Napoleon was before than Christopher Columbus, you know. And it does, in, but the truth is that, where is that uh, order? It doesn't exist, it's, it, everything is in the same space. So I am interested in that subject of time. So no matter what they do, if it's a drawing or whatever, it comes out, the subject comes up. You know? And the humor, I think the humor maybe is the only tool we have to cope with the situation because we really, we never know the answer, which is in a way good because it's the motor to make us make art, write books. You know, if you, if you analyze all the philosophies, they are all wrong because they come to a new and a new one, no? So it's a history of mistakes. And now what happened, now is more accepted, all kinds of things. But in the time, let's say, of impressionism, when somebody did an idea, it was to annulate the one before. Like the, the concept of having different ideas that were contradictory but accepting the two didn't exist. Now I think there are more the awareness that we really don't know, so let's accept all of them. No? I always say that one day I was in the, this is something that because it was a revelation. I was in the subway and there was this guy, a Chinese guy, reading in Chinese. And I said, wow, I said, eh, it's interesting because I know he understands. And I don't, but obviously there is, is, there is something, even if I don't understand, the thing exists and has meaning. And I think that that is 
the answer of the big question that we don't know. That I have the feeling uh, that the thing, the answer exists, only I don't see it. It's obvious, it's there, but we, I don't know how to read it. No? And so, but that notion that it exists for me is enough. No? Uh, some people may say, I think it's worse to think, I think there is no solution or there is no answer. It would be worse than to say there is. So in that sense, I am an optimist. No? And <laughs> so in the, I think the humor is, uh, because I'm interested in the subject, in, in humor, how it works, uh, because it's, it's like, uh, I, I think it's a way of coping with things and to, uh, it's a, some kind of humble or intelligent way of uh, trying to, you know, to say, okay, it's, and laugh instead of cutting your veins, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, something you just said it, I think is so profound and I want to see if I understand. So this idea that just recognizing that meaning exists but not necessarily having the tools to decode it. Right. But just the the no, the, the just the knowledge that it's there that you're seeing it is has value to you, and and is the, do you think that that in some way plays into what emboldens the artist to go into this kind of unknown territory to sort of to embrace the amateurness of being an artist, the idea of exploring? Like, do you think that that has anything? To yeah, I think there is a phrase that this Argentinian writer says. Borges said that. The aesthetic experience is the imminence of a revelation. I think it's a fantastic phrase, no? Yeah. It's the imminence of a revelation, not the revelation. But that imminence is, is incredible, no? That's beautiful. Yeah. That, that is, and it really gets back to your work to me because um, I think that the, you know, the figurines themselves are so lovely, and they do seem like they come with their own narrative, their own story, and you, there's something endearing about that. But the, the power of their, every piece is that little space just between them, or that little interaction, maybe touch, or the, or mm -hmm. the, the potential of touch, is where all, to me, all of the power exists. It's interesting, because I, I did a whole series of dialogues, so, you know, you put an object and then you start taking objects and put it on to see if they relate. <laughs> and when they do, it's so nice because they are meant to each other, not for each other. Like the Nazi soldier and the bulldog kissing. Yeah, in the video. There yes. is a video I did and there is a part called uh, Kisses and they are all sorts of character kissing. And I found this dog with a Nazi, the Nazi of the photograph before, and they kiss, no? So it's film, and then I, they are separated, and the look of the Nazi was like he, he changed his expression, which I didn't touch, like saying, what did I do, no? What did I do? <laughs> the dog should have said that. <laughs> No, also because um, uh, they, these characters are put in a situation that is before any judgment. You don't think Nazi's good or bad, or it's there, no? And they also kiss or something, no? So it's, it's like in a non-judgmental space. Yeah, no? exactly. That's, there's, a, there's something, I can't even explain what you do, just adds to the humanness no matter what the subject is. It just, um, you know, to me, I read the, the Nazi when he pulls away, it's like he had this unexpected attraction to the dog, like the, <laughs> just this, <laughs> well, do you know, just experiencing love, like it's not, it's taboo, it's not appropriate, but it's, but it was real, I just. I told the dog not to get involved, but. <laughs> I think somebody there will. Okay. okay.
Um, I'm wondering how much you think about like the transference of your labor onto the figurine. Like I really loved when you're speaking about the painter who's painting the circle, and then you're like, "Oh, he took my work away from me." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's um, well, in that sense, I am drawing something that he's supposed to be. I am him, no? So, uh, so what should I say? <laughs> what? what? Just like this is another. Maybe it's another point of connection between, you know, there are these these figures that are um, experiencing moments together, but here also there's a line between an invisible line between you and right, you right, because, because, because you, in a way, you are the one who says who. Um, how do you say, take that situation in your vocabulary. Like, if I wouldn't relate to that, I wouldn't use it. So, yeah, you are the one who moves the object, who decides the photograph is okay, or, you know, who makes the narrative. So there must be an explanation. But we need Freud for that. No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the new, the the, the collaboration between you and Miska Smithfer in New York in that time, and what type of like energy was driven into creating something at that capacity when you know print wasn't was just kind of forgotten in the contemporary art. Well, we were super young. This was 1964 when we did the group, and who, if you know Luis Kamnitzer, he's a theoretician and very like writes manifest and you know things like that. The other guy who died, uh, he was a Venezuelan guy who cooked really well and was the public relations person. Hmm? And also he, he was fantastic criticizing and uh, doing practical things. No, the size should be like that because the frame, you know, things, practical things. And I was, uh, I don't know, the, the romantic artist. And, but we really connected very well, the three of us. And we were in a moment that we really wanted to super analyze what we were doing and be very hard on each other. So the, the thing we discovered, we, the three of us had, was that we, as printmakers, which is something printmakers have, is that you get so involved in the technique that you forget that you have to say something besides texture. No? And so we started to analyze what each of us had to say or what was the subject. And so that was a very good um, uh, you know, conversation because we were really good. Uh, at, we love each other so Everybody, nobody got offended if you, you know, criticize the other. Also, we were interested in the political side of printmaking, the idea of making um, multiples instead of a single expensive work. And also, further than that, we wanted at that point to avoid the gallery and avoid uh, the commercialization of art. So we would do exhibitions, what we called at that time, which is funny, exhibitions by mail, mail art. So uh, for instance, I did one, the first one I did was called To Be Wrinkled and Throw It Away. So you receive in the mail um, a page with the image of a wrinkled paper. So you were supposed to wrinkle it and throw it away. If you kept it, if you kept it, you did a good thing. Because, <laughs> because the, it, that thing of the not commercialization, I realize now, was not in our hands. No? But anyway, uh, so if we, for, for instance, we were invited as a group in the, there was this show called Information in MoMA, was an important show in, I think it was the 70s. And we were doing that exhibitions by mail. So first, Luis Kamnitzer, who was the most uh, political, said, no, not in the MoMA. We are not showing the I don't know, capitalistic or what. And then <laughs> Jose said, no, come on. You know, Jose was the more realistic. 
this show it works. So, okay, so finally the work was a table with pens and um, envelopes. And a thing on the wall that said, the New York Graphic Workshop announces its 14th um, uh, exhibition by mail and, and our names. And then if you wanted to receive the exhibition by mail, you put your name in the, in the envelope. So Luis Kamnitzer was very happy because he thought a lot of people were going to put the name so the MoMA was going to go bankrupt because I had to spend all the stamps. <laughs> <laughs> and so then the, what people really received <laughs> was the same thing, but instead of saying announced, it says announced. <laughs> Which to me was great because it was a plane on time to Luis was that thing of the stamps. And you know, like we both, that was youth is called. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if I answered the New York graphic workshop. So, you know, we did all those analyses and, and we also invented an artist at one point to, a, it was like a fellowship. Because there was a time that there were a lot of publishers that you could sell a lot of editions. And so we had this, uh, when we became more conceptual, the publisher didn't buy anymore because he couldn't sell those things. So we decided to invent this artist, Juan Trepadori was the name, and was exactly what the publisher wanted, you know, color, and it looked modern, but at the same time was sellable. And so if we had any artist who needed money, he would make a Trepadori, and we would sell it to the publisher, who I think he knew that it was an invention, but I guess he didn't care. <sighs> Thank you so much. That was so